So the reason that small factions, despite what James Madison wanted them to do, have a lot of power in a political system is because of some economic principles. Um, and so we're going to talk about that because this is an economics class. Um, but we're also talking about democracy here. So it combines both of these ideas into one general topic here. So why do we even need kind of small groups of in, small groups of people, interest groups to get involved in the policy process? Why do we want these factions? Um, in theory, we want like just individuals going off and talking to their Congress people about stuff and not forming interest groups. Um, but that that's kind of like the the democratic ideal of just everybody being directly involved in governance. But that's never been the case because it's, it's hard to do that. Um, instead, interest groups provide people with all sorts of avenues towards government. Um, and so what ends up happening is like individuals on their own without trying to organize into any larger group are unable to advance the common interest at all. Or if they do try to advance the common interest, they're not going to do it adequately. You need kind of a more concerted effort to promote human rights, to promote your 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 favorite policies and to lobby uh, Congress people to to pass laws. Um, there's also this famous quote here by Margaret Mead that um, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. You very rarely get one person that just kind of takes on the whole political system and passes laws um, to um, create brand new um, legal rights for people. It's always been um, kind of a, a small, like small groups of very concerned activists and very concerned citizens or um, very concerned lobbyists who, who want to get um, good deals for their industries. Um, that's just how the governing system works. Um, and it works this way because of economic principles. And so if you think back to um, kind of national political campaigns um, and think of how often you have donated to a national presidential campaign, um, or volunteered for a national presidential campaign. Um, I would guess that most of you, if we were in person, I'd have you raise your hands and, and answer these questions here. But I would guess that most of you maybe donated 10 bucks to, to a presidential campaign. In the primary season, you may have gone and knocked, doors, uh, knocked on doors for specific candidates. Um, but once it gets to kind of a national stage near like October, the month before an election, very few people start getting involved. And it's because you don't really benefit from getting involved anymore um, personally or kind of the your individual actions participating in a huge group and a huge concerted effort end up not really mattering at all. And so your participation in kind of a national campaign like this that is massive ends up not really doing much. And so having these big campaigns creates something called a public good, where if a presidential campaign asks you to go knock on doors and you don't, they're still probably going to win if they're ahead in the polls and they're probably still going to lose if they're not ahead in the polls. And your one individual action is not going to do much. And they can't really exclude you from the presidency or from benefiting from the presidency if they win um, because they're going to win regardless or lose regardless. And so um, there's no real incentive for you to get involved. And some people do, and that's great. I've donated to presidential campaigns um, and then get on emailing lists for months after and I regret it. Um, but I've never volunteered. I've never knocked on people's doors for specific candidates at a presidential level. Um, and this is because the individual gains, the benefit that you get in giant groups are basically zero. Um, and so if you think about this in economic terms, there's no good reason for a rational, self-interested person to donate to a national campaign or join a union or support activist causes that are a huge activist cause. Like you're not going to go knock on doors for Amnesty International because everybody else is going to do that. They're just huge. And so there's no reason for you personally to get involved. Um, it's similar to like public radio. Most of you have listened to NPR or have watched PBS before, um, but I'm guessing that most of you have also not donated um, to NPR. Or if you have, it's just kind of a minimal amount because you think that other people will do it. Um, and so you free ride on everybody else getting involved. And that is a perfectly rational thing to do as well. I listen to NPR podcasts all the time and I've only donated to a couple. Um, and I feel bad whenever they ask for money, but I also think other people will do that. 
um, because it's a large group effort. And so I'm not going to get involved. And so what you essentially have is a public good where the achievement of any common goal um, means that um, that whole pursuit of the goal is a public good. NPR cannot exclude people from listening to their stuff. Um, and you listening to their stuff doesn't make it so other people can't listen to their stuff. Um, and so you not paying for it doesn't make it so other people can't listen to it. And you not paying for it doesn't make it so you can't listen to it. So there's no rational reason to get involved because it's such a huge thing. It's such a big interest group. And so you're not going to, to get involved and you're going to end up free writing. So in big groups, um, the natural inclination is to, to not get involved. But in small groups, this is where um, the incentives start changing. And so if we were in person, I would ask this question, how many of you have gotten involved in low level elections, like a city um, election or a, um, a neighborhood election for like a homeowners association? And lots of people do this. Um, lots of people will go knock on doors for their neighbors or for their friends who are running for city council or running for some county commissioner seat or something. And that is because um, once you start tackling these issues with like a city council or trying to elect city council people or county commissioners or these low level things, then your individual contribution to that effort actually matters. Um, these elections are often won by like 600 people voting total or 500 people voting total. And so getting an extra two or three or four votes matters a lot. Um, compared to an election where millions of people are going to vote. And if you get one more person to, to move over and, and vote for your candidate, neat, but they're still going to win by like a million votes. And so that's not going to really do much. But as soon as you get into the small group, then your individual actions actually provide benefit. And so when you're in a small group, they're really good at harnessing this. Because if you don't contribute or don't get involved in the group, then they can exclude you from it. Um, if you're really interested in a small uh, civil rights campaign um, and you don't get involved, then like you can be excluded from kind of the benefits of, of working in that. You don't benefit from, from the campaign working because it won't work without you. And so when there is little free writing in a group and you can exclude people and, and stop people from, from just taking advantage of, of not being involved in the group, um, that group has a lot more power. Um, which means that ultimately um, Madison was right um, about his, his fear of, of small groups um, getting lots of power. And so that's why he had the Federalist argument of, of encouraging large groups so that um, uh, these smaller interest groups don't get too much power in the system. And the reason they have so much power is because of, of this whole idea of, of the individual calculus where individuals, if they feel like their individual action is going to do something, then they're going to be more motivated to get involved. Um, and so that is why Madison was afraid of it. So if you're a large group, if you're the Red Cross, if you're Amnesty International, if you're a national political campaign, how do you make it so that individuals that you want to get involved in your cause don't free ride and don't just sit in the background? Um, easiest way to do this is to change the individual calculus. The reason people don't get involved in these bigger causes is because there's no personal benefit for them. And so if you can provide some sort of personal benefit for them, then they'll get involved. Um, one way to do this is through coercion, um, where you can say like, you must join this cause or you don't get the benefit of it. Um, and so in, in some states, unions require that you join. Um, in right to work states where um, politicians have made it so that um, joining union and paying union dues is optional, but you still get the benefits of working or of union coverage. Um, once that happens, there's all sorts of free writing in, in unions um, where you have all sorts of non dues paying union members because the government took away this coercion lever to get people more involved in kind of this greater collective action. Um, you can also increase the benefits of acting. So instead of um, increasing the cost of not acting and kind of punishing and coercing people, you can pay people or encourage them to get involved. Um, the Red Cross is really good at this. Um, when you donate blood, they're not going to pay you for the blood, um, but they give you cookies. They have like a reward system where you get points and then you can trade those points in for like camping chairs and and computer bags and other stuff and you get like cool benefits for getting involved in kind of this larger cause. Um, the NRA 
um, is really good at this as well. They um, like they have lots, they have millions and millions of members of the NRA, but it's not necessarily because all of these people are going and um, getting involved in gun rights advocacy. Um, it's really, if you go to this website here, this benefits.nra.org, it's essentially a giant coupon book of discounts that you get as an NRA member. Um, and so what gun activists or gun rights activists have been doing over the past few years um, in the wake of kind of mass shootings and stuff is they've been able to target the NRA, not by trying to make the NRA illegal, but by targeting the people in this um, coupon book here, removing the benefits that that NRA members get. And so if you get like hotel discounts um, because of NRA membership, then activists have been able to track down those hotels and convince them to stop offering discounts. Um, and so what that ends up causing is the benefits of joining the NRA start disappearing, which means membership starts disappearing because people don't want to get involved in a giant group when there's no personal benefit for doing it. Um, and so um, that's another way you can get people involved um, in large group efforts. The third way to change kind of the calculus uh, around working in a big group is to make the big group feel small. And what this essentially means is like creating a federation. Um, where if you are something like um, Amnesty International, um, they are based in, in the UK um, and their general strategy is kind of set there, um, but they're still really good at getting smaller country level um, Amnesty International branches um, to get very involved in their activist causes. And the way they do that is they kind of pass on the authority to um, to these smaller organizations, these country level organizations and regional organizations to set their own agendas and to, to choose what they want to advocate for um, with the approval of the main London office. And so um, you're able to kind of take this larger cause and shrink it down to very local causes so that people get more involved. Um, political parties are really good at this. Um, the national political parties, like the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, it's hard to get people involved in those, but college campuses will often have a college Democrats or a college Republicans club um, that's like a, a smaller branch of the party. And that helps people get involved in kind of party politics at a low level. And it helps you feel like you're actually making a contribution to um, not the, the broader party in general, but kind of the smaller college based version of that. And so as long as you can federate this huge um, interest group into smaller interest groups, then people are going to get more involved in the, this whole calculus of, of benefit that you get from being in a, in a small group. Um, it makes it feel like a small group. And so those are some, some different tools that you can use if you do happen to have a huge interest group that you're trying to lead. Um, lots of you nonprofit people are going to face this issue, um, especially if you're going to work for a big organization like CARE International or um, any sort of large advocacy organization. It's really hard to get people involved. Um, but it's because of these small group dynamics. If it's a big group, people are going to free ride. If it's a small group, then there's individual benefit and people are not going to want the free ride and they're going to want to get involved. Um, and so whatever strategies you can do to get people involved um, will give you more power and more ability to, to pursue your policy preferences. And so this brings us to this moral of the story here that actually poses an interesting conundrum. Um, small groups can be too powerful and can exert a lot of influence in the political system. And Madison recognized this in the Federalist in Federalist 10. That was his main argument. And so his solution is to use big groups because then that way we'll have more uh, positive policy outcomes. We won't be subject to the will of a small interest group that wants to impose its um, policy preferences on, on the population. Um, we won't have lobbyists um, that want to impose their version of peanut butter, for instance, on the whole population. Um, we can kind of curtail that through kind of using large groups. Um, but the problem with using large groups is the bigger the group is, the less it will further common interests because people won't get involved and people will free ride and it won't be as effective, um, which poses a problem. Um, so the solution to that is to make small groups, but then that goes against Madison's whole argument of using big groups. And so that is a, a difficult thing that you have to overcome. Then you get all sorts of, of bad problems here where you have if you have very concentrated interest groups that are very focused on one element of, of policy setting, um, 
then they're able to get their policy preferences enshrined in the law. But if you have a huge group of concerned citizens, but they're not going to get involved because it's just kind of, it's hard to get involved, there's no benefit to doing it, then they're not going to. And it's going to be this giant silent majority that's not going to do anything. And so as a result, you get these narrow interest groups um, that exert enormous influence on policy. And the large groups of concerned citizens, even if they're super passionate about it, are going to be stuck with free riders and it's going to be hard to get anything done. Um, so is that okay? I don't know. Um, these are some questions that you could um, look at in your um, reflections and your weekly reports for this week. Um, if we were in, in person, we would discuss these things. Um, and so what does all of this mean? These whole, this group dynamic, the small groups being um, potentially too powerful, make it so big groups um, tamper down their, their power. Is that good? Is that bad for democracy? I'm not sure. And what does that mean for public administration and policy? Again, I'm not sure um, because um, we do want kind of concerned citizens that are pursuing um, good policy preferences and like per, uh, trying to change police reforms and um, fix inequality. That's going to be done by small groups of activists with lots of power and lots of non free riders. Um, but at the same time, that those same dynamics are the same things that um, industry lobbyists use to get their policy preferences in place. And so it's, it's the same procedure. It's just two different endpoints. And so is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Write about it in your in your uh, weekly reports and figure it out amongst yourselves.